Hello again, class. This is Professor Krauss with Lecture 13, where we are going to be focusing on the answer to sin, the cross of Christ. Let me open us with prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to teach about the greatest news in the entire world of your love in sending your Son to die on the cross so that any one who believes and turns to you from their sin, they can be saved and set free. Help me as a professor to teach this material well, to make it clear, and help all those who watch to be able to understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so lecture number 13. In lecture 12, we focused on sin, the bad news. If you were to uh, read through the Bible over a course of a year, you would see not only a lot of different descriptions of what sin is and the consequences it brings, but also examples of sin. Uh, but it also equally, throughout God's Word, we find the good news that even though we are sinners, even though our relationship with God has been severed, uh, God has a plan to rid the world and more specifically uh, human beings from sin. Now, because the Bible talks about sin and its effects in different ways, it also explains the good news in different ways. Uh, Paul writes that there is going to be no more condemnation. So, you know, when we are condemned of something, it means we're guilty. We uh, stand guilty before a holy God because of our sin. But in Jesus, that condemnation is taken away. There's no more shame, uh, no more guilt. Uh, also, the good news, and this is the really good news about the good news, is, is not just for some people. Uh, the good news is not just for religious people or people who are well off or good people. Uh, the good news of Christianity is for everyone, anyone. It doesn't matter your past, it doesn't matter what you've done. Anyone can be saved by turning from their sin and turning to Jesus. But the good news is only good news because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Now, if you were to do a survey of religions, you would see lots of different symbols that <clears throat> represent, even illustrate something about that religion. The Buddhists have um, the lotus flower. Modern Judaism often uses the Star of David. The Nazis use the swastika to represent their worldview and what they stood behind. But for Christians, the major symbol ended up being the cross. Uh, John Stott, who wrote our one of our textbooks, uh, Basic Christianity, also wrote another book, an excellent book, The Cross of Christ, and he says this, In the early centuries of the spread of Christianity, Christians wanted to commemorate as central to their understanding of Jesus neither his birth nor his youth, neither his teaching nor his service, neither his resurrection nor his reign nor his gift of the Spirit, but his death, his crucifixion. Stott's not saying that those other aspects of Jesus and his life are not important. Goodness gracious, the, the resurrection uh, is central to the Christian faith. But the early Christians recognized that apart from the cross, there was no good news. There was no salvation from sin. Uh, now, when you think about the cross, we see people with tattoos. Um, you see people with necklaces, bracelets all sorts of things with the cross, which is kind of ironic when you understand what the cross is. The cross is an instrument of death. It was a way to put people to death. Why would Christians choose the cross? Well, it's because on the cross, Jesus, the Son of God, gave up. He sacrificed his life for our sins. Because sacrifice is central to the Christian faith, the cross must be central to the Christian faith. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, the central Christian belief is that Christ's death on the cross has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. So where sin fractures our relationship with God, through the cross, our relationship can be restored, not because of something we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. 
Now, I'm not going to read through Mark 15. It's a long passage. I invite you to pause this recording and turn to Mark 15 in your Bible and read through it because it gives us the clearest, longest picture of Jesus' crucifixion. But the important points to help us understand the significance of Jesus' death on the cross would be, number one, It was the Jews foundationally and the religious leaders even more that wanted Jesus crucified. They took him to the Roman leaders uh, and and said that Jesus uh, first was going to start an insurrection, that he wanted to be king, which of course would have you know, would have riled up the Roman leaders because the one thing they could not afford in in Galilee and in Jerusalem and these locations was another person stirring up an insurrection. Uh, But they also, the Jews, wanted Jesus to be dead because they thought he was a blasphemer, that he was saying things about God that were not true. Uh, Specifically, he was claiming to be God. The Jews in their law did not have the power or they they would not put people to death. And so they wanted the Romans to do it. Um, Number two, Jesus was both mocked and beaten. He was uh, scourged, which we'll talk about in a second. But it would have been a brutal, brutal um, beating that Jesus took. Um, 39 lashes is what they would typically give you. They thought 40 very likely would kill you, so they would get you all the way to that point. Uh, He suffered for six hours on the cross, so this was not a quick death. Uh, And then there were these supernatural elements that really emphasize that there is something bigger than just a death going on when Jesus dies on the cross. There is darkness in the middle of the day, complete darkness. The curtain in the temple, which is where uh, behind the behind the curtain in the temple was the Holy of Holies, where God's presence would dwell. Um, because of His holiness, uh, sinners could not come, you know, in into contact with God. Uh, could not come into the Holy of Holies place, the holiest um, place in the temple, because to do that would mean instant death. And so there was a curtain that uh, that would separate the Holy of Holies, and people outside of it. That curtain was torn supernaturally uh, when Jesus died. A Roman centurion who at the time beforehand had mocked Jesus and beaten Jesus now confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. And we'll talk about why this is important in a second. Women were witnesses to Jesus' death and were uh, witnesses that began to spread the word. In the cross of Christ, John Stott writes, Crucifixion seems to have been invented by barbarians on the edge of the known world and taken over from them by both Greeks and Romans. It's probably the most cruel method of execution ever practiced, for it deliberately deliberately delayed death until maximum torture had been inflicted. The victim could suffer for days before dying. When the Romans adopted it, they reserved it for criminals convicted of murder, rebellion, armed robbery, provided that they were also slaves, foreigners, or other non-persons. Just to tell you just how severe it was and and how cruel it was. Um, Crucifixion was used specifically for how cruel it was. Uh, The Romans became masters of torture. And they they would actually, there are historical... Uh, accounts of being able to keep people alive for days and days after the torture and through crucifixion. The Romans, uh, crucifixion was so brutal, the Romans did not crucify their own people, with the only exception coming for um, absolute treason, for you to rise up against the emperor would be a reason they might use it. But other than that, even murder, they would not crucify their own people. Because Jesus was condemned as a blasphemer by the Jews. Um, Falsely, uh, Jesus was painted as this rebel who wanted to overthrow uh, the Jewish religion, overthrow Caesar, overthrow the Roman emperors, the governors. Um, And that's why the Romans would even entertain a trial of Jesus. Now, Cicero was a famous philosopher that was living during this period, and this is what he said about crucifixion. It's a most cruel and disgusting punishment. Uh, Later, Cicero argued that to bind a Roman citizen is a crime, to flog him is an abomination, to kill him is almost an act of murder, 
To crucify him is what? There is no fitting word that can possibly describe so horrible a deed. The Jews also saw the cross as an abomination and a horrific instrument of death, but for a different reason. Uh, looking at their own scriptures in Deuteronomy 20, 21, 23, uh, the Jews uh, said anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. Therefore, anyone, even someone who was innocent, who was hanging on a tree, like, of course, the cross, uh, they would be seen as falling under God's curse. So what exactly was so brutal about crucifixion? Well, first, uh, it was the pre-torture of flogging, the scourging, the whipping that uh, beat up the person leading up to it. So flogging or scourging that was used uh, is they would take these these straps of leather that were you know a couple feet long, and they would put inside of these straps bone and glass and rock, and they would use it as a whip. So when it hit someone, it would literally grab their skin and it would tear. And so they would do this, you know, 10, 20, 30, almost 40 times, even before you were put on a cross. Um, Jesus was also, he, they put a crown of thorns on his head. These, you know, not just like little bitty thorns, but these huge thorns that would have dug into his skull, be covered in blood. Uh, there were spikes in crucifixion. There were these huge nails, huge spikes that were driven through. Usually, not just your hands, because your hands would tear. So they would either they would either uh, tie your wrist to the cross beam and then drive it through your hands, or they would try to drive it right through that the bone where the nerve is. And then again, they would drive it right, not just through your feet, but through right above your feet, like where your ankle is. So you can imagine having those spikes driven through your your arms and your legs, your hands, your feet to hold you up. Now they they put these little wooden, usually they put wooden uh, things on the bottom where you'd put your feet and you would begin to uh, suffocate because when you're hanging like this, you can't catch a breath. It would restrict your breathing and so you'd have to push up and pull up on the spikes just to be able to take your next breath. So you're you're suffocating, you can't hardly breathe, you're bleeding out. And most often you were hung naked to kind of display your shame to the world. And this is what Christians believe Jesus did, that God himself did for us on the cross to save us. When the Jews and others that knew the Christian or the, or the tradition, the Jewish tradition, saw him on a cross, they would have immediately written him off because they would say he was cursed. And what they didn't understand or what they didn't believe was that Jesus was willing to be cursed. He was willing to die so that we could be free from the curse of sin. Uh, if Jesus didn't die, we would all still be under the curse of sin and death. But because Jesus was willing to die and take that curse upon himself, take that shame and that guilt for our sin upon himself, anyone who believes can be set free from that curse. One of the reasons that is often given for the truthfulness of the story of Jesus' death on the cross is that if Christians were just making up this story, if this was just a story to get people to believe in this new religion, the one thing you wouldn't do is kill your hero. Uh, even more, you definitely would not kill your hero on a shameful cross. If you were trying to get people to believe and follow this new religion, you would not say, well, our hero, the one we want you to believe in, was crucified shamefully on a cross. And yet, the early church continued to follow Jesus' teaching. They continued to follow him um, even after his death and resurrection because they knew it was true. If, if Jesus was a false leader, then as soon as he died, and he, if he stayed dead, uh, which is what normal people do, then surely they wouldn't continue to follow him. Even many of the followers die later on for a lie. But they knew it was true. They had seen his miracles. They'd seen and heard his teaching. They saw all those things, and then um, they saw his death. They saw his resurrection. So it wasn't making up a story, but telling the story that they knew to be true. Another good proof of the crucifixion, uh, which is gonna might sound weird to us, is the reliance on women as eyewitnesses. Because in the first century, 
It was a completely patriarchal society where women had very little value, especially when it came to being a witness. In a court of law, a woman would have had very little, if any, say. They would not have believed her testimony. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, when they give evidence of Jesus' death and his resurrection, they actually point to women. You know, the, 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 the people who would have read the New Testament, the Old Testament and the New Testament in the first century, if they had any questions about what happened, they could literally go and talk to the people who witnessed it. They could have talked to these women. Um, they could have asked them questions about what they saw. But the fact that the biblical authors would have pointed to women and said they were the ones that stood by the cross and saw Jesus die. The women were the ones that went to the tomb on the first day and saw that he had been raised from the grave. Again, if you're starting a fake religion, you never would have included women as your eyewitnesses. But Christianity wouldn't start trying to start a new religion. Jesus' followers weren't trying to start Christianity. They were trying to spread the truth of what they knew. And that was pointing to the women who were faithful to the very end and who saw Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus' death on the cross and what he accomplished there is one of the major ways that Christianity differs from other religions. As we've spoke about in class before, whereas other religions say that to be saved you need to go and do certain things, Christianity, on the other hand, primarily points to the cross and says it's not about what we can do to save ourselves, but what Jesus has already done to save us on the cross. So what's left up to us is not to go out and try to be good people so that God will accept us, but to turn to Jesus who died as a sacrifice on the cross for us. That is where we are accepted by God, is we're accepted in Jesus because he's already done the work for us. He's already died for sin. He's already overcome death. And when we believe in Jesus, we're accepted in Jesus. We're not accepted by God because we're good people or because we're better than other people. We're accepted because we trust in Jesus. So C.S. Lewis concludes, The really tough work, the bit we could not have done ourselves, has been done for us. We've not got to try to climb up into the spiritual life by our own efforts. It's already come down into the human race. If we'll only lay ourselves open to the one man in whom it was fully present and who, in spite of being God, is also a real man, he will do it in us and for us. You can say that Christ died for our sins. You may say that the Father has forgiven us because, because Christ has done for us what we ought to have done. You may say that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. You may say that Christ has defeated death. They are all true. And that is the good news of the cross. I hope this has been informative and helpful for understanding Christianity and what Christians believe. The good news that even though we are sinners because of the way we've lived, because of the way we've turned away from God, there is good news because of the cross of Christ. If you have any questions, uh, reach out to me by email or leave a question in the comments. God bless.